All right, hello there. Thanks for joining me. I am Dr. Jen, and this is My Life as a Landlord. I'm so pleased you're here today educating yourself in the rental business by listening to today's show. In any business, there is sales, even if you don't have a product that you're selling retail, for example, but what about providing a service? Well, when it comes to housing, are we providing a product or a service? Maybe it's both. I believe in any business, you're always selling, selling ideas, selling your experience, selling your value. That's even true in providing housing. So I've asked sales expert and former Marine, Ben Brown, to help us talk about the selling aspects involved as a landlord. Welcome, Ben. Well, thank you for your service. Well, thank you for your service. All right. <laughs> once once a Marine, always a Marine, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. We're not born. I say we're not made, we're born. There you go. Mm. And you're in, I'm on Maui today, but you're in Florida, Tampa, right? I got it right? Tampa, Florida. Isn't technology great? Uh-huh. <laughs> How long have you been in sales? Uh, not to show my age, but right now I'm almost up to 28 years. Wow. You're very grown up, Ben. <laughs> love it. That's what my kids love tell it, me. Love it, love it, love uh, it. Okay, so what kinds of things are you selling now? Now, I'm doing mainly my coaching business, which is one-on-one -on -one coaching that I specify. In our podcast that we're going to cover, I'm going to try to get some takeaways for your guys who are working, like three things that they can use today that will automatically turn them into pretty good salespeople down the path. So right. I'm going to help them with that. Number two is that I actually do a limousine service I've done for 14 years. Mm -hmm. And then also I work hand in hand with one of my former clients who owns a book company that does self-publishing out of Denver, out of uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So I've been working with them for three years, helping them with sales um, because she's an introvert and I taught her how to sell. She made an extra $160,000 in three months and then came to me and said, don't want to do it. And so I said, well, I already wrote a book. I know what it's going through. So it was one of the easiest sales jobs because I just got to tell people what not to do. <laughs> well, it'll make it easy when I write my book later this year. Um, yeah. So that's good. And look what I have. Your Ooh. book. In fact, uh, is my blur working? I'll put it right in front of me. Oh, we you got got matching. Two. We're matching. There you go. Well, I ordered it as soon as you and I had talked originally. I said, this gentleman is an expert. I need to learn from the experts. So I've got your book. I've just mm -hmm. glanced through it. Admittedly, I have not read it yet. I just got it yesterday, but even just looking at some of the stuff as I'm looking through going, even the recommended reading at the very back, I went, this is cool. It's not just a list of books. It's why you should read them, which, you know, I don't necessarily like checklists, but that's, you know what, this looks really good. I'm really happy that I've got it. I'm going to go through You're it. You're a landlord. You have a checklist. You bought houses. I have lots have of checklists. Checklist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You caught me. You caught me. You're right. I got lots of checklists. I've well, in sales, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny that we we're talking about checklists and I, I've talked to several, several landlords on social media and we have brought up sales and they go, oh, I'm, I'm a landlord. I'm not in sales. And I'm thinking- are you sure? What do you think, Ben? Are they are landlords in sales? Well, sales is everywhere. Um, sales is life. Everything around you is regarding sales. The way I teach it is to actually connect that with people because <clears throat> I actually explain very simple because sales is simple, but it's not easy, right? Simple, but not uh, easy. So the concept is what I always ask each host. What is the purpose? So I asked you, Jennifer, what is the purpose of a sale? Uh, isn't it to get somebody to do something? No, not a sale. Close, close. Make some money. <laughs> Has nothing to do with monetization. Simpler okay. than that. Hmm. So one more. Um, what is the purpose of a sale? See, we do it, but they don't know how to explain it. This is the Yeah, crazy. isn't that weird? I, huh? I don't know. You got me. I don't know. So the purpose of a sale is to get someone to move. To move, okay. So when you open up your cell phone, how many people are asking you to move? Click on this, swipe this, go this way, give me your email, check on this. You drive down the street, check this billboard, stop here, go here, take a look at this. By the way, do this, give me your emails, hit this key. 
um, send this code to your phone. It's all movements, right? So when a child asks you to pick them up, they're asking you to do something. They're asking you to move. So a sale does not have to do with monetization. If you understand the simplicity of it, when you add the money in, it makes sense because we've been doing it since we've been born. We've been taught out of it in Western civilization because we're taught in a system, if you don't earn it, you don't buy it. Hmm. You, don't ask for a set, you don't ask for a lower price. You don't negotiate. So that's why when people go overseas, which you have, and you go to the market and you sit there and watch the tourists freak out because people are nagging them to buy, they're not used to it. But this is the way we actually formed our civilizations until Western civilization came about with price tags. So if you can't, mm -hmm. and then those are negotiable too. People don't know. You can go to a store and negotiate. Everything's negotiable. So the people who have the money is the one who negotiates the hardest because they don't spend it because they know to ask. Right. Well, and what kind of things for landlords selling? I mean, price tag is is the rent on a on a unit, but would rent be negotiable too? Everything's negotiable. When you do repairs, you bring in people to do things for your house. That's negotiable. Mm -hmm. Now you have ability to do it based on car. Uh, can you put it on a credit card? What if I gave you cash? Right. See what they do. Can you move based upon that? If I paid you twelve hundred dollars, but if I paid you cash, would you take a thousand? I save twenty, almost ten percent, just by asking. And most people don't ask; they just do. Mm -hmm. Right. The only thing we're trained to negotiate is cars and houses. But everything in life, you're in a relationship. If your husband stops selling one day, you will quit. So that's what divorce is all about. So that's selling on another whole nother level. Dating is a sales. And so I read the book on um, the game, which I for entertainment, I always ask people to read that because it's very interesting. It's giving you step by step checklist of how to do the pickup and pickup artists are guys that don't have the personality that most guys would have like me back in the days where it became natural. They turned that into a system, which were guys who would normally couldn't pick up girls can use the system to pick up girls and actually have a social life. And Everything is based in sales on confidence because most people don't ask enough questions because they don't have the confidence to ask and they can't deal with the rejection. So most of the time around nowadays, when I started, it was like up here. Now people confidence levels are down here. So 80% of sales, I look at the screen right here, right? 80% of sales is confidence. So building that up is what I have to do in the beginning when working with people to understand that it's a, it takes work. Uh, it doesn't come automatically and uh, you're going to have to deal with rejection and the better you can deal with rejection, the more you can actually deal with it. Gotcha. Well, I see lots of landlords on social media and uh, they usually have a nine to five J O B somewhere else. Their mm -hmm. identity is something else. It's not landlording. And as a result, it's almost like they they are hiding as a landlord or they don't necessarily want to come off as a landlord. And and I'm wondering if that confidence piece has to do with it. Is I wonder if their confidence as a landlord is low. You think so? It's it's another job that you have to do. You have to deal with people skills. So depending on what job they do at work, most of the time they're not dealing with individuals. They're not dealing with rejection. That's why people do nine to fives, right? Mm -hmm. Sales is a skill where you go in and you have to earn your your badges every day you go into it's the only position at a company where you go in and have to earn your job every day. If you're IT, HR, you know, you work with graphics department or you work in marketing, your job is to go in and just do your job. Sales, you have what's called quotas. Right? So if you don't make the quotas, guess what? So every position normally in a sales position has a number on that desk or chair that the company is expecting you to bring in every month because you get salary plus commission, sometimes just straight commission. Um, I'm one of the days I worked in the boiler room where it was, I worked straight commission for four years. Every week we got paid. So you made your check every week for four years. It's like football player. You got another game every week. So when I came out of that system, I didn't understand how to operate. I was, I was PTSD from sales. So I'll tell a funny story. I, I left that and I went to a, a headhunting firm. And it was like, you're awesome salespeople. And I'm like, okay, because I was doing $180 a day, right? And so the people were like, um, hired me and said, well, we're going to start you off with 39000 
um, I said, 39,000 leads? Because you had to earn the leads every week, right? In the room, boiler room. Okay. 39,000 leads? They go, no. Like, we're going to start you off at 39,000, you know, base. Base? What is base? They were like, are you going to pay me just to come in? I was like, oh, my God, this is heaven. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so, you know, I was working in boot camp for four years when I got into the real world. It was easy because I was doing outbound sales for four years, doing about 180 dials, no computer, nothing but fax machines, and a black phone in a room, 125 guys, like a stock brokerage all day, just, and nothing to, nothing to focus, no emails, no screens to look at, just a black phone and a notebook. So you were just pounding the phone. You had nothing else. And everybody was looking at everybody. Why are you not on the phone? Everybody, why are you not on the phone? So you constantly was on the phone. Right. So when I see people today, I'm like, get on the phone. They look at it like a, the cell phone's like 2,000 pounds. They can't pick it up. <laughs> so you can't pick it up. They, people's skills that just went down to, you know, with technology and texting and everything else. It's just incredible. So the people that can actually acquire the skill to pick up the phone will have the advantage in the next five years. I, you know, Ben, it's funny you talk about the fear of picking up the phone and I I'm working so hard on this podcast and, and my upcoming book is all about awkward conversations and about the words to say. And mm -hmm. so that that will help landlords and business owners in general know, have confidence that they know what to, to say and, and, and different words to say. And so quite often I'll bring up an example and I'll say, and, and it might sound like this and it might sound like that. I've got a couple podcasts coming up. Uh, one of them is uh, a, a, about 50 ways, or maybe I'll do a hundred ways for a landlord to say no, different ways for somebody to say no. Um, but you know what? I could also say it a hundred different ways that a landlord could say yes, right? Depends on what motivates them. So sometime in selling, right. it's like, uh, you know, uh, the numbers game is normally 3%. So out of a hundred dollars, you normally get three sales. Wow. Okay. So that's real numbers. That's normal. Yeah. So, but if you look at it, people like, oh, I'm trying to get three sales. But then I say, okay, don't focus on three sales. I could turn around and say, tell me how many no's you get. So if your performance is good and you focus on your performance, which is a process, and you're counting the no's, I say, I want you to get 50 good no's today. And the goal was 50 good no's. How many sales you got? Seven. There so you, you go. weren't going for three. You were going for 50 no's. So you just changed it around and look at the performance that you did just based on the perception on what you wanted to do, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, so that's it, what a good sales man manager does. I love it. It's change change the pers perspective. Change it how you look. I, here's I here's the thing I'll tell you real yeah. quick. Scenario. You have a child. Child is in, in, in severe, severe situation where they have to do a transplant, life-saving transplant. God help you, anything. And the doctor comes to you and says, listen, we need a transplant for your child. We have a list here of 15,000 candidates that your child can actually uh, be able to, uh, we, but we have to call all 15,000. Can you help us do that? How many <laughs> calls can you make? <laughs> Interesting motivation. Flip how many, how many right? calls would you make? 15,000, right? If so when people say child, I can't, it. oh, I can't, it's just you don't have the purpose. So one of the things I teach people, you have to like or love what you're selling. You have to like or love what you're selling. Like it, you love it, or leave it. Like it, love it, or leave it. So if I've got landlords that really hate <laughs> being a landlord or, or they don't want to pick up the phone or they're afraid to pick up the phone, they might need make, to leave it. Make enough money to hire somebody to do it. There you go. So create some systems. Create some systems, and and that's the the other the other aspect of landlording with sales is that um, if I'm not good at sales, then I need to find somebody like Ben <laughs> that is good at sales to do sales for me, which is a good yeah. thing. Yeah, One of the people I work with, you know, after working and training, learn learn to do it. Didn't like it, and it's the only client that I ever worked for out of years because I like the system and what it does. It doesn't take a lot of my time, and it works. But 15% is what I get based on that. So she don't have to worry. Yeah. Right. So if you're making enough money to get 
what will you do as an entrepreneur? Your job is to replace yourself from positions and things that you don't like to do by making the money. You, you know, that's what your job is. I had a potential client that reached out to me, does everything for the company, $2 million and everything like that. And then at the end, I'm like, well, here's your cost. It's going to cost for me to come on board. And we're talking five figures. Um, it was like, well, I just want you to come on. And I'm like, no. I'm like, I don't know what you're thinking. I'm like, you need to replace yourself. If you die today, this whole company's down. I'm right. trying to come in and replace, put systems in place, build it, help sell. I have like three positions that you want me to come in to do. And you don't want to, it's like Charlton Heston from that 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 um, NRA meeting from my cold, dead hands. So some entrepreneurs, were, as entrepreneurs, we're hard to release ourselves from those positions and um, that's what you need to do. And that's what prolongs the growth of companies normally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's interesting. Um, let's talk about entrepreneurs for a second. I, I look around and uh, I've learned a, a lot about the characteristics of entrepreneurs, just not, not about creating systems and not necessarily about selling. Mm -hmm. But uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his book, uh, Outliers, brought up a really interesting statistic about dyslexia dyslexic, uh, usually dyslexic children fail so often and have so many problems in school mm -hmm. that they make great entrepreneurs. And the reason why is because they know what it feels like to fail, to battle, to, to not be the straight A student like I was. My husband is dyslexic. Um, several of my close friends, are you dyslexic too? Oh yeah, my you goodness! Didn't know that I thought I, no. I thought that's why you brought it up. No, but isn't that funny? But the, the, I I forget what the statistic is in in Malcolm Gladwell's book. I think it was one in three entrepreneurs is dyslexic, and I think that's one of the reasons why is because they've already experienced that rejection you're talking about, which makes perfect sense of why you're in sales, Ben. Because I was you're so not happy to find I was so happy to find out I was handicapped. It was regardless. 27 years old, I found out because if we would back in the days, we would write down manually the, the credit cards on the deals oh. that we did. Oh, so no. every day, every Friday, you turn in your deals and you got paid. They would run the cards Friday. And on Monday, your, your pay sheet would come out for Friday. So if you didn't write the credit card statements down or if it didn't run, you come back on Monday, there would be credit cards, you know, sh deals on your and you didn't get paid till the following week. And every week I kept having these deals like and I would go back and call the guy back and it would be like one, two numbers off. And I was like and I've been dealing with this my entire life. Nobody died. I, I was a, a brilliant C student. Um. Marine Corps was perfect for me. It was all action, artillery. And so, and I was the recorder on that actually did the asthmus. So I I had to give out the right number. So I don't know how I didn't kill anybody doing that. Um, and so I realized, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. Somebody came up to me. It's like in the back and said, you know, you, you, have you been tested for dyslexia? I'm like, what are you talking about dyslexia? You were like, uh, this and that. And I did the research and I realized, I'm like, this is the problem I've been having all my life. I thought I was an idiot. So no. you just you realize that you're handicapped. So you're able to overcome a lot of, you know, that's why the Marine Corps was kind of like a cakewalk is all failure and, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, like businesses, things go wrong in the business. Like I had a trucking business. I looked at the numbers, didn't even have to look at an Excel spreadsheet like you, just based on my head. I'm like, this is not going to work. And I shut down a hundred thousand dollar business in in three months just like that just because of it and, and just took the loss and just recovering from it and just keep moving so yeah you're right about that it is it is one of those it is analytical people and there's that type of deal so when i sell to people i'm glad we get this conversation yeah hardest people to work with in sales <laughs> this is a, it's a list and i know this for years like doctors yeah. Lawyers to my top four to hardest to sell to doctors because they can't make a decision worth anything. The knowledge is just way out there. They're not decision makers. They're just they, they do it. They, they have office managers. They can never make a decision. It's not their job. They, they got too much going on in their brain. Lawyers too analytical. 
They look at everything. You, you cross a T wrong, the contract, like, don't even deal with them. They just, like, don't even start. Um, doctors, lawyers, um, car managers for car dealerships, which I dealt with that. We had to okay. sell advertisement to. So imagine you're calling. Your business is to call new car sales managers around the country. Mm -hmm. These guys have been selling for 35 years used cars. The gold bracelets, the gold necklaces, third wife. These guys have been selling fake tans. These guys are ruthless, right? Right? It's like timeshare guys, right? And then number four, number four uh, psychologists and PhDs. Because they know everything. Well, I, it, I, I don't know everything. <laughs> but they think they know everything. So when you, it's all about getting them to make a decision mm. and they become so wrapped up into it because they're, they're thinking from a, from the book, not logical, emotional, but from a book standpoint, a studying type deal where they can't, it doesn't connect and you get frustrated because you're more logical from the sales standpoint. So you know what you're up against. So there's different ways you can, you can use that. But the, yeah, those are the four people if you could sell those, uh, you know, you got, you're a good salesman because you're Cause dealing with a personality disorders. But it's it's tough to make a move, right? In the yeah, it's because they want to they want to. Well, you know, and it's like I'm getting you to move. I'm giving you relevant reasons, but you just don't want to do it. Not because of your personal it's just because of your training. There you go. Yeah. So for landlords getting getting back to sales with landlords, when a landlord puts out an ad for for a unit, that can be one of the, the scariest times for a landlord, especially a, a landlord that is relatively new, uh, hasn't done a whole lot of turnover, uh, maybe has gone through a rough eviction, whatever. Um, but the move part for the landlord, sometimes is I see these little Craigslist ads or you know ads on Facebook Marketplace and they'll throw their little pictures out and they'll have just two or three lines and that's it. There's no call to action. There's no request to move. There's no anything. But in contrast, I, I like to think I'm doing it right, but I'll know once I read your book, <laughs> if I'm doing it right, where in my ads, I say to move forward, you need to do this, this, and this. And most of it is we need to know who you are. Even if they keep messaging me, it's like, look, the next step is through my system and I need to know who you are before you can see the unit, right? So it's uh, it's interesting. And, and, and of course, my systems are set up now. So my confidence level is high. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. And I don't know everything. But I'm excited for my landlord listeners to hear you and to learn from your book about their identity and their confidence level as a salesman, as a salesperson going, you know what? you really are in sales. You're selling your credibility. You're selling your, your speed of response. You're selling your value. Yes. As a unit, you know, offering the unit that you're offering for rent Right. also as a business person. And so selling can be hiring a handyman as well. Right. If you yeah. can't. Yeah. So I, I love the conversation, um, Ben, as we go through this, because if you can't make someone move, mm -hmm. then you probably need to hire someone who can or rephrase some of your, communications which i like you said rephrase because sales yeah. is a language okay what do you right? mean what do you mean sales is a language sales so you're a learning language. a language because most people are talking at you they're not selling you so there's a difference okay what's the difference well when you're talking you're having a conversation with somebody you think you're selling because you're not making the move you don't have the stages to make you're not asking them enough so when okay. it's a difference between talking to somebody and selling them, and most people think that they're selling because they're talking about the product that they have, and that's not selling. That's a presentation, right? So when you go through the book, you understand like step number four, emotional triggers. What is the emotional reason? People buy based upon what they want, not what they need. So you're trying to sell them on something they need, but you need to sell them on something that they want. What it has in the house, is it schools? What is going to make them move towards that? Is it safety? Is it the price? It's normally not the price. Right. It's the color of the walls. The is it the size of the rooms? Right? People mm -hmm. buy for weird reasons and not asking enough questions is the reason why they don't move. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you get to the close, you don't have to close as hard because you understand the emotional triggers of why people want things. Right? So I, t I give an example. A, a bottle of water, right? I offer you a bottle of water. Just regular bottle of water. How much would you pay for it? 
couple bucks. Maybe two, three bucks, right? Sure. I pour gasoline on you and set you on fire. How much would you pay for it? 50 bucks. <laughs> You're on fire. How much yeah. would you pay for? Right. A How much would you pay for? Yeah, anything. Anything, right? Yeah. So it's the same bottle of water. Mm. Okay. Nothing's changed. Molecules still the same. Still same quantity, but it's what you want, not what you need. I'm not thirsty. I'll pay two, three bucks. I'm on fire. I'll pay whatever. Same I same item. Interesting. I like it. I like it. Wow. What else should we talk about, Ben? <laughs> I can't wait to read your book. Oh my gosh. This is great. Yeah. I'll give you one more uh, exciting sure. concept. You see a homeless person, right? Okay. I always bring this up. Okay, a good homeless person, and we're only steps away from being a homeless person. I always give that caveat. Sickness, illness, something happened in your life, it can happen to any one of us. Mm -hmm. We're not immune whatsoever. But a good homeless person that has good mental aptitude, you know, they always have functions and things like that, but good mental attitude and knowing a good area to be in, which is like a good street corner or whatever, um, <clears throat> on average in the United States in a good city, how much can a person make per day? Doing what? Panhandling? Ask, yeah, well, your panhandling. How much can oh, they make? Per panhandling. Um, oh, I bet they make quite a, a lot more than I want to say. I would probably say three or $400 a day. Normally between 300 to $700 a day. Wow. Now follow me down this deal, right? Okay. Now, there's a characteristic of why this is. Okay. So that person on the street corner, you give them money. Now they don't have a business card. They don't have fax machines. They don't have. They might have a cell phone. They don't have a website. They don't have a social media. They might have that. They don't have rent. They don't have uh, office. They don't have employees. No they don't have none of that. No overhead. Right. They're making three hundred, seven hundred dollars. Now entrepreneurs out there normally not making that profit per day. Right. That's why you don't see them out there every day, but they can make that, right? When you give that person your money, what do you get in return? When I give a panhandler my money, mm -hmm. what do I get? Mm -hmm. There's a Sounds transaction, there's a sale going on, right? Right, making okay. You, move. you have moved and went into your pocket and given them something, right. which is a value. You give them money. What do you get in return? Significance knowing I've helped someone? No. <laughs> okay. I give what up. Do you, I don't know. What do you get in your hand? What do you get? Uh error? No, no money. You get what? Nothing. I get nothing in return. Yeah. So how can a person that is on the street corner can make three hundred to seven hundred dollars a day. An entrepreneur cannot do that on a regular basis. What's the difference between the homeless person and also the entrepreneur? Hmm. I I don't know. You're the setting me up, Ben. The homeless person can do that. They're selling absolutely nothing, right? Right. How can they do that nothing? An entrepreneur normally has a product or service. Homeless person is kicking an entrepreneur's butt. Yeah, no kidding. The reason that is, is because the homeless person has a characteristic called focus. They don't care what they look like. They don't care mm. what their family tells them. They don't care. They're not there for coffee breaks. They don't care what happens in the news. They don't care about the game. They don't care about the religion. They don't care about what people tell them. They don't care how much rejection they get. They don't care what somebody says about their breath, what they look like. People scream at them. They don't pay attention to that. They're focused because they want something. It's either food, water, drugs, alcohol, place to sleep. They're in survival mode. Right. So most entrepreneurs don't have that characteristic of focus. That's the difference between a homeless person and an entrepreneur.
So if I could take an entrepreneur and put some type of focus towards their product or service that they like or love and train them in that, they can do as well as the homeless person. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> I don't normally learn stuff on my podcasts like this, Ben. This is, <laughs> you've really hit me with a curveball, which I love. Amazing. Okay, what else? Tell us more. All right, so I'll give you I'll give you the one. So there's four great salespeople in the United States. Okay. I told you one of them is a homeless person because they're mm -hmm. what? Why? They're Why are they great? Because they're focused. Number one is a child. Oh yeah. How is because they don't know any better and they close. They can close. They don't care what's in it for you. They don't care what's in it for them. They close, close, close. We teach children, hey, stop asking so much. You only can ask me three times. You get tired of it. So we're born to sell. Okay. It's been trained out of us because we're in a Western civilization to go to school. Don't ask for much. You go to school, earn your degree, and earn your money so you can buy what you want. You don't ask for it. But in some cultures, you know you negotiate. Right. Some right. countries, you know, it's rude if you don't negotiate. Right. right. But Very much so. The civilization has been trained out of us. So a child is the best salesperson in the world because they are relentless. They will ask. So when you have a child do that and I could take a 30 year old male who's been in a corporation and finally an entrepreneur and I ask him to ask for the sale at least three times. He freaks out like he's two years old and I got a two year old who kick your butt. <laughs> okay. Number two is a church. Church is good because you don't go to church without bringing your wallet. Churches mm. are the great because it's traditional. You're supposed to ask. They give you three different ways that you can give to them. Anonymous, non-anonymous, or you could just give money, right? So right. they covered all three personalities. No such thing as a burnt church. Right, right. System has been built. It's one of System the best sales. Number three is QVC and Home Shopping Network. And the reason they're great is because they know the customer more than they know themselves. They have data on everybody who's bought something from that company. And they know exactly what, what color they like, where they're from, when they're going to be awake, what they bought last time, how much money they got. So when they bring the products on, they already know their soul before they put them on TV. So they know exactly when Miss Jan's going to be awakened and want that blanket and put scarcity. There's only three left. She wants to be involved. It's part of the game. And that's why when you go to those people's houses, you can't fit the car in the garage for all the stuff they bought. And so the, the fourth one is the homeless person. So if you can close like a child, if you could be traditional like a church, have that characteristic, that's good sale. If you know the customer more than they know to themselves, if you have that characteristic, that's good. Those are the four things that I can teach. Or if you're like the homeless person and be focused, you're good. Now, if you have any one of those characteristics, you're a good salesperson. If you have all five of those, there you go. You're deadly. <laughs> As you say with a big smile on your face. I love it. I love it. Well, Ben, if uh, if a listener wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, the book is on Amazon. It's called Master Your Art of Closing the Sale by Benjamin Brown. It's been out since 2016. Um, I have a website, 360 Sales Consulting. But for your listeners, if they like to, I have a special group that I train one-on-one. -on -one. I don't have a lot of people I can train because of time, but I give the link uh, for people and uh, it's meetwithbenjamin.com and they can go on there, click on that, and they can schedule a one-on-one -on -one session with me. I only work with people that I can help um, or want to help and only through that is finding out the product or service because I like for your new clients to pay for me, not you. So I have to mm -hmm. see what you're doing and you have to like or love the product first. So it's a lot of work, but uh, it's well worth it to have a gift of uh, sales and learn how to sell that you're going to use throughout your life and throughout your personal life and everything else is that. So Jennifer, based on that, what have you learned in this podcast so far? Oh Give my goodness. I, I thought I knew a lot about sales uh, because I, I, I once upon a time sold Mary Kay and learned how to say it a little bit, but uh, I learned that I know nothing about sales, <laughs> that I need to read your book because you schooled me more than once. <laughs> That's what I learned. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a teaching, being able to 
teach it as a blessing because I wasn't the best salesperson. There's no such thing as the best salesperson in the world. It's always a growth. But being able to, I'm, I'm different from a lot of people because I've not only done it for years, but I have the uh, the ability to teach it. It takes about 40 days and then the light bulb comes on and people say, now I understand what you've been trying to tell me. So it's like taking people out of the matrix and understanding the whole world around them revolves around this thing that they've been either ignoring and not understanding and the life perspective changes because now you can use this tool in all parts of your life like i went over and negotiated this thing the other day and i'm like yeah tell me about it and then they asked me and then i went in and i did this and man i saved 700 dollars. i'm like mm, yeah you like that i just love it i could use it all the time <laughs> <laughs> then my kids came up and asked for money and i started using the technique on them i was like mm -mm -mm -mm. not selling because it in re all reality, if you're either not selling, if you're not selling, then you're buying right. in every conversation. So you have to make a decision whether you're, a if you don't know whether you're a seller or a buyer, guess who's the buyer? Yeah, exactly. I get it. I get right. it. What a right, pleasure Ada? to have you on today, Ben. Super happy yes. to have you. That's great. <laughs> And uh, if you haven't already, listener, check out Ben's book, uh, Master the Art of Closing the Sale by Benjamin Brown. You can find it on Amazon. And I did check, you can find it on amazon.com in the US and also amazon.ca in Canada. You can get it on both sides of the border. So regardless of where you're listening from, you can get it. It's Thanks in so Canadian. Much. It's in Canadian. It's in Canadian. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today, Ben. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. And awesome. if you like it, love it, sell it. There you go. Uh, listener, if you enjoyed the show today, my, the biggest compliment you can give me is by leaving a review so the people that can, who need my podcast can find me. Thanks. Let me turn the recording off. Hang on just a sec. Stop recording.